Okay, so Emmett Kelly is giving you the piece of cabbage, and he's very sad, and he recognizes the sadness. So now take us up from there. I mean, that's just beautiful. Another important part of that when I look back, it's just so many layers, is the sideshow. Mm. So there were tall people, fat people, snake people, tattoo mm. people, um, young girl, probably 19 with no arms and legs. I mean, there were all of these people, and mm -hmm. they were they were normal, mm -hmm. you see. We ate together. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing about the circus was very hierarchical, so the families had their, like even in traveling on the trains, the, the Walenda say they had their own car. Um, and then my mother and I would travel in the women's car. My father would travel in another car because we were more the peons there. Mm -hmm. Or in eating the, the, in the dining tent. All this was intense. It was not indoors except Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. um, it was just surrounded by little midgets, tall giants. Um, Fellini. And they were... <laughs> It was, it, this, was, this was what people look like. Right. It wasn't like, it was only a sideshow to people who weren't part of the circus. Now, I just stop for a moment because you mentioned the flying Walendas, and I don't think people would re remember, you know, you and I of that generation. But can you just stop a little bit with the flying Walendas because they were so famous? And it, Well, here's another piece then. Um, I forget how many people were in the family, but the older gentleman... Bruno, I think his name was, wasn't it? I don't remember I anymore. But he would stand underneath. As they were tightrope walkers, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and they didn't have a net. And he would stand underneath them so that um, if they would fall, he would catch them. And um, I, would, I identified with him, mm -hmm. not with the tightrope walkers. And there was one act where the one man... Um, was riding a bike, and then there was somebody on his shoulders, and then off the bike there were women doing things down. Anyway, they did fall, and wow. I was not there, but I, um, the old gentleman, I don't know if he was killed, or some of them did die, and some became, I don't, again, I was a child, so. I kind of remember that. Yeah. Um, but he was the one, I was always waiting to catch them, even though I was not. Wow. Um, not then there was Uranus, I think was his name. He would stand on one finger, and I would just Im absorb these people, just absorb them. Um, my father was very much against my um, participating in the circus, so I watched. I'd watch these kids my age doing trampoline things or whatever. I just kind of walked around, and I, I belonged to the circus, so I was safe, people knew who I was. So I could wander. In a way, it is like a Fellini. I just wandered through this world. Hmm. Um, my mother has a story um, somewhere. She actually recorded it for me not long before she died. Um, when she learned to ride this Roman racing, mm -hmm. she was standing her first time out, and there was another woman and a man. And... Um, they were racing, I don't remember how many times around, the three rings. And she, the first thing they taught her was how to fall. So if you were falling, you, you sat on one horse. So in going around, she fell. But what was so amazing, she got back up in mm -hmm. the race. And it brought down the tent. And as she was riding out of the tent... Uh, John Ringling North, who was the owner, congratulated her, and she said that was the highlight of her life. Mm. And she and the woman was angry, feeling she did it on purpose and took. So, you know, people killed each other. I mean, this was not a. This was not a um, friendly group. No, the competition was high. Wow. Anyway, she was very angry that she had done it on purpose. Well, she never fell again, but. The rumor went out because he, the man like my mother and the woman, like whatever, they were going to kill her. They were going to race her off the track. So they wanted her not to race. She said, I'll race and win and I won't race again. And she did. I mean, this is a kind of world. 
it's an amazing world there. It's like not like wow. a house and a car. <laughs> <laughs> now I have the house and a car, right? I have two cars. Okay, so yeah. so when was it? I mean, I mean, I was not born yet. This was before I was born. The, with the racing, the room. But how did you get into modern day? I mean, how how did what's that segue there? What did I well, mean? Was that the segue, or was there something that um, I don't know? My mother was a dancer, so six months of the year she danced in uh, Miami Beach on shows and clubs. Uh, is she a tap dancer, or she was any kind of dancer. You would want Gucci Gucci. She actually danced. She traveled with uh, Imogen Coco. Oh, yeah. I think at one point she mm -hmm. was friends with Red Skeleton's first wife. Mm. She danced somehow. She got what was her with name? Milton Berle, Ruth Wilder. Ruth, I I th I think I remember that. No, you wouldn't. I don't. I, I don't think you would know that. Really? I did uh, two videos of uh, experiential anatomy and the teaching of young dancers, and I called it Ruth Wilder Productions. Oh, my goodness. Um, wow. So I danced. She danced while I was, when she was pregnant, and I danced. I remember my first teacher was May Rose. I was three. So I always danced. And, and you she, went into modern? Uh, what, I no, mean, tap. it was tap, ballet, toe, acrobatic, oh, and jazz. Oh, you did? I did all of that. Great. And um, sometimes she would go to class, and then we would come home and do it together. This was one of the ways we shared. And I, um, I'm not sure I would have survived my childhood without dance. That was really my... I could say the same. Yeah, my thing. Mm -hmm. And, and why do you say that? Because this because, is important. Well, because one of the things that happened was when I went to ninth grade, there was a physical education teacher. This was a new school. I, I grew up in an area of Hialeah that was considered on the other side of the railroad tracks. And um, my mother was a bartender. My father was, she was called a barmaid in those days. He was a bartender. And then I had a stepfather who worked. He was a racetrack. Or, and then, anyway, so it was... Kind of an underworld, really. It was, I grew up in the under. My father had mafia friends. So where's the Jewish intellectual... Uh, I married him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the Jewish intellectual. Okay. So you Except were that, that you my mother... Two, no, what was that uh, gangster? The my, um, Henny somebody. Myron... Uh, oh, I'll remember it. Anyway, there were a lot of dark things in Miami, and I, mm -hmm. I was friends with the daughter of some of the dark people. And there was one guy, I don't remember what his name is, he told my dad, you don't like somebody, Joe, take care of him for you. He was a hitman. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, there was this, this world of, um, who was the guy who wrote those books? Henry? You don't mean O. Henry. O. Henry. O. Henry. Uh -huh. A lot of the characters in his uh -huh. books. Anyway, but my mother, because she had had to quit school, she was adamant that I would have be well educated and uh, she worked really really hard and uh, never complained and she saw that I mm -hmm. she was not a good teacher I remember sitting on her lap when I was four and we would read this book and she would say I just told you that word a minute ago <laughs> you know not your not your calm uh, and do you have siblings mm -mm. Yeah. well I have a half sister whom I met when I was 63 oh my god it was my father's. Oh. Oh, that's another story. Yeah, that is a story. And how I, anyway, that's But anyway, so story. you were the only... But I was fostered with a family with a daughter who was six years older for six years, part-time. Mm -hmm. That's another story. There are a lot of stories. And that's mm -hmm. part of um, mm -hmm. who I am, is that there are a lot of stories. Mm -hmm. and, and how to bring all of those stories. I know you have your own stories, how you bring all those stories into a one person. Mm -hmm. And how that person is evolving always and accepting all those pieces. Right. So anyway, in ninth grade, mm. there was a physical education teacher called Miss Jordan. And she was not a dancer at all. She was a little bit, um, well, I won't say. But she, she somehow went to dance workshops 
and started a program at the high school in modern dance that we could take instead of physical education. Oh. So for four years every day I had modern dance. And basically it was just, it's amazing. I, it was improvisational. She, I don't know how she did it, but she was quite extraordinary. And one woman asked me one day, one, one girl, she said, why is she so hard on you? And I said, because she knows I can do it. Mm. And she just drove me in a certain way. Um, and again, in the background, there was a band leader in the circus. I don't remember his name. This is what, 50 years ago. And he, for 50 years, he never missed a performance. Wow. The show must go on. So there's this other thing which, when I became ill, I had to really let go of. You know, I want to just pause here for a moment because I need to ask you this because it seems to me I revere my dance training because it gave me the ability to endure. Of being able to, in other words, you show up, it doesn't matter if you feel good, you don't feel good, it has nothing to do with moods, it has nothing to do with anything. I. I thank my dance training. I'm like, as I'm listening to you, I'm feeling the fortitude of what it's taken for you to um, bring your ideas out, to be not be not be overwhelmed or conquered by the forces that would ordinarily defeat somebody, and it, you were you've been able to rise to the occasion. But I'm very aware that my dance training gave me an edge that there's a certain sanctity to becoming a dancer, that you're entering this lineage, that this amazing lineage, and I think of Isadora, and I think of the revolutionary dancers, of course, Nijinsky, and I think of the, the kind of flaming courage. <laughs> what? No, go ahead. I mean that it took to do that, and that we inherit that when we go to class, it seems to me. And that, you know, I'm listening to you and I'm feeling that. And so I don't want it to just go by, you know, but just to say that fortitude and that, that uh, courage and just determination, and particularly with the illness that you had as well. I mean, you know, when I, if I ask somebody to do something for two hours a day, you know, if they, you know, they just, they look, you know, they look at me like I'm out of my mind. If you, somebody who's, who's, who's a dancer, they go, oh, is that it? Is that all? Oh, only two hours? Because they know they're, they've been initiated into this splendor. And I, and you know, as I'm listening to you, I'm also feeling the, you know, the motivation that I have in, in creating this broader idea of kinesthetic brilliance that of as a dancer gets older they they can't do their you know it's a short career but what do you do with that brilliance and that capability to pierce the veil okay so go on it's not, <laughs> enough, enough enough out of me <laughs> yeah no it's great it's, it's what well i mean that's why i i feel that i mean you know i'm listening to you and i'm just feeling well that doesn't come from nowhere i mean yeah you come from the jews you know that's what gives you you know the the ability to survive pogroms and stuff like that but but the dance training is such a reverence it seems to me that you become part of this cloth so you know I just think that's so important for those who come after us. But I don't know how people. What year was this uh, person with the with the modern dance? This woman, this P P teacher.